Hello, everyone. We will be starting our session now. Welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm Colin Barton. I'm a patient. I was diagnosed with ALK cancer in 2016. I am chair of the ALK Positive Medical Committee and I lead the research review panel. The research review panel is a panel of volunteer members of the ALK Positive Support Group, each with experience reviewing scientific grant applications. The research review panel works hand in hand with leading doctors to select the awardees of the ALK Positive Research Fund grants. With me is Emily Venanzi, who is also a member of the Medical Committee and Research Review Panel. Hi everyone, I'm Emily and I'm also an ALK patient diagnosed in 2017. Colin and I are so excited to have many of the investigators supported by the ALK Positive Research Fund here with us today to talk about their projects including their research goals and how their efforts might lead to improved outcomes for patients. Now I'll share my screen. Alk Positive started fundraising for preclinical research specific to Alk Positive cancer in 2017 and awarded grants to Drs. Awad, Gaynor, and Nemanoff in 2018. In 2019, a grant was awarded to Drs. Lovely and Bavona for a collaborative project. And in 2020, Awards were granted to Drs. Awad and Dagogo Jack for phase one clinical trials and to Dr. Iafrady for preclinical research. The awards have totaled an incredible $2.7 million so far just since 2017. And we're looking forward to funding another 1.5 million in grants later this year. This is thanks to the superb fundraising and donation efforts of the members of Out Positive. We're now going to hear brief 10 minute presentations from each of these leading researchers. That will take about 60 minutes and then we have 30 minutes for Q&A from the audience. Unfortunately, Dr. Namanoff found out just yesterday that he is unable to attend. So the good news is that means we will have an extra 10 minutes for Q&A. As you are listening, if you have any questions, please enter them into the chat. In the final Q&A, Emily and I will read questions relevant to the research for the doctors to answer. So first, let's hear from Dr. Awad and his colleague, Dr. Kiale. And before we do that, I just want to thank all the doctors for taking time out on their weekend to be here at the summit with us. And we're delighted to have you with us. Hello, hi, Colin. I think I might start because uh... Uh, Dr. Award told me that he has a little bit of trouble connecting and hopefully he will join later for the discussion section. So uh, let me share my screen. Okay. I hope everybody can see it. Okay, so uh, as Colin introduced, Dr. Award and uh, myself, Dr. Kiale, were awarded uh, uh, recently uh, a grant from the ALK positive group to uh, develop uh, an ALK vaccine. What is an ALK vaccine? An ALK vaccine is a, an immune instrument to instruct uh, the immune system of patients in this case to recognize the ALK protein. And you can see here on the right side of these slides in brown, these are tumor cells that express in brown the ALK protein and the immune system that we want to uh, instruct will be able to target these positive cells and eventually kill and eradicate them. So we tested this hypothesis first in, uh, in mouse models. And uh, here is just one example. Uh, mouse model, of course, are not the same as in patient. However, they recapitulate some essential feature of the, the human disease. Um, and so you can see here, circle in red is different tumors that are detected by uh, MRI 
in, in the mouse lungs. These are transgenic mice that express the ML4 ALK fusion protein. And eventually over time, they develop uh, uh, several tumors in the lungs. And by introducing a vaccine, you can see here how the picture is completely different. Uh, first of all, the tumor that is already existing is kind of stabilized over time. But more importantly, there is no chance for new tumors to form, implying that when the tumor are small, a vaccination against ALK can really stabilize the tumor or even uh, induce a regression of, of the smallest one. And here you can see what happens directly in the tissue. So on the left side is a mouse tumor. All of these are tumor cells. And you see that in normal condition, there are very few cells from the immune system that are called lymphocytes. In particular, these are T lymphocytes that are a subset of them. And during vaccination, you see first that the tumor is much smaller, kind of shrinks down, and is more importantly, is heavily infiltrated by these cells in brown. And these cells in brown are really the immune cells generated by the mouse in this case. And of course, we are hoping to do the same with patient. And they recognize the tumor cells, they go inside the tumors, and they force a regression of, of the tumorous cells. And that is what we aim to do in patients. And of course, we have additional weapons that we plan to combine with a vaccine, which are the ALK inhibitor that, of course, most of you know, because probably are going, are treated with, with ALK inhibitor for, for a long time, hopefully now, and eventually the combination with additional way to stimulate the immune system, which are called immune checkpoint blockade drugs or uh, immunotherapy drugs. And you can see what happens when we combine an ALK inhibitor in this case, we are using a, a kind of first generation, all type of ALK inhibitor, crizotinib, that maybe some of you experience through, through uh, their treatment. Uh, but the same concepts are true also with second generation alecnib and third generation lorlacnib ALK inhibitors. So you see here that a mouse that has a tumor is treated with an ALK inhibitor and the tumor goes away, but then eventually the tumor comes back in the same position and grows bigger and then new tumors are formed. However, when we combine an ALK inhibitor plus a vaccine, you see that the two tumors disappear and they never come back in the same position, okay? Eventually, very small tumor can develop late in time just because the tumor can become exhausted uh, over time. And so how can we move this concept toward the clinical use uh, for, for developing an ALK vaccine? So first of all, we demonstrate and this, of course, is a, is a work done uh, on patient treated at the Dana-Farber Cancer Center by Dr. Awad, of course. Uh, we first demonstrated that patients can spontaneously develop an immune response against the uh, ALK, the protein, in tumors. So this speaks to the fact that, uh, that these patients really built up, at least a subset of them, built up a spontaneous immune response to recognize the ALK protein. So we develop a similar uh, protocol that we aim to bring to, uh, to human in a phase one clinical trial. And uh, here is what we did in the mouse first to validate the concept. And it's a little bit of a crowded um, slides, however, follow the colors. <laughs> and uh, the colors tells that uh, in black, if you don't treat this tumor in mice, of course, all of them progress and die fast. If you treat with an ALK inhibitor, you can extend survival. However, all of them, all the mice still die. But if you combine an ALK vaccination with different type of immunotherapy, and I'm not going now through the details, we can discuss later in the question and answer session, but if you combine a vaccination with different type of immunotherapy, you can uh, achieve different type of results, extending overall the survival and, and curing the mice up to, in the best condition, 70% of the mice are completely cured by the tumors, something that was not achieved by the ALK inhibitor alone. Uh, in this direction, to move to the clinical trial, we discover the peptides, so which are part of the ALK protein that are immunogenic in patients. We validate them in mice to show that uh, uh, they really, they are human peptide, they really are immunogenic in the immune system of, um, uh, of mice that have been humanized to, to be more similar to the human immune system. And finally, this is <clears throat> probably the last slide, 
I'm commenting, but uh, apparently Dr. Award joins. So Mark, if you are there, you can comment the clinical trial. Otherwise I can finish with this. If I don't hear from Dr. Award, I will just uh, continue and finish the slide. <laughs> so basically uh, this is the clinical trial design in which uh, each of the arrow is a vaccination. So we plan to, to treat patient and then Dr. Award will be more specific which patient will be uh, eligible for this type of trial and how we plan to conduct the trial. So we will defer that to the later session. Uh, anyways, the patient will be vaccinated. Each, each of these arrow is a vaccination. And then of course, we will study how tumor development develops over time by baseline biopsy and eventually uh, uh, studying the immune system reaction through the vaccination process. And we will have two cohorts, one combining an ALK inhibitor with the vaccine and the second combining an ALK inhibitor with the vaccine and an immune checkpoint therapy, something that will further potentiate, we think, uh, the efficacy of, of the vaccinations. And uh, of course, this uh, clinical trial is supported by the Al Positive Group, Longevity Foundation. We have other type of support by the Koch Institute, the Bridge Project, the Dana Farber, and of course, one company that is called Elysio Therapeutics is here. So Elysio Therapeutics, you see, we are working with them to develop this clinical vaccine. It's called LE003. Is so far the crude name of the vaccine. Hopefully, we'll we'll change it when we will really start. We are at the very late preclinical stage and we hope to start the phase one clinical trial next year. And again, we can be more specific in the uh, question and answer uh, session. And I think I can stop here uh, and uh, looking forward to your question. Hopefully it was clear enough. Hello, this is Mark Awad. Can you hear me? We, yeah, we yeah, Mark, yeah, we can. Mark, are you there? So, yeah, thank you. He... Thank you so much for that great presentation, Dr. Kiale. Yes. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Justin Gaynor from uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, and he'll be making a presentation about the research that he did with his 2018 award. Great. Thanks so much. I'll just ask Dr. Kiale. Yeah, perfect. Um, so, let me just pull up my slides. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, first off, I wanted to thank you so much for joining us. I, I also wanted to thank the Alk Positive community uh, for this uh, really meaningful uh, award. Um, I think I can speak for all of my co-investigators here that uh, these awards are these Alk Positive awards are particularly meaningful because they come from you, the patients. Um, and so they are uh, especially inspiring. And I think all of us uh, have, have really uh, redoubled our efforts uh, to, to really advance therapies uh, at an expeditious pace. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna be focusing on is uh, our uh, efforts to try to under, uncover uh, more effective immune-based treatments for alk positive lung cancer. I think Dr. Chiarly uh, gave an excellent overview of one approach, which is using ALK vaccines. I wanna take a step back for a minute and, and really distinguish, you know, there are two major paradigms for how we have been treating ALK positive lung cancer. Uh, for the patients out there and families, uh, no doubt you've likely been focusing a lot on the left side of this, which is the targeted therapy piece. You know, these are using the ALK inhibitors uh, targeting the ALK fusion. Uh, what I'm going to be focusing on is the right side. These are immunotherapies. These are agents that are trying to stimulate the immune system and using the immune system to attack the cancer. Now, I think it's important to first even give some rationale for why our immune systems may be targeting uh, ALK and specifically these lung cancers. Um, so if we take a step back, you know, uh, we typically think about the immune system as 
targeting things that are foreign, right? You know, obviously uh, viruses are in the news, uh, bacteria, um, but they can also, the immune system can also attack cancer. And the principle, if you look at the bottom of this slide, we can see that as cancers develop additional mutations, that is new misspellings in the DNA, um, they can reach a point where they look more and more foreign to the immune system, right? So the more mutations, the more they can look foreign to your immune system. And if they look foreign enough, the immune system can recognize uh, the cancer. Um, when we think about immunotherapy though, it, I think we have to remember that it's an incredibly broad term and it actually captures many different types of treatment. So uh, I think you hear it very nicely from Dr. Kierley. Um, if you look in this figure here uh, uh, on the bottom, we can see vaccines. So these are antibodies that, that are targeting a specific uh, foreign antigen. So antigen is just the term we use to describe you know, what, what the immune system is targeting. Um, the other types of immune treatments that I think are relevant when we think about lung cancer, one is, uh, it's labeled here, immune checkpoint inhibitors. These are, these are drugs that are given intravenously and essentially what they're trying to do is they're trying to block the breaks on the immune system. Normally your immune system has these checks and balances that prevent uh, the immune system from overreacting and essentially what those agents do, these are blocking one of those breaks on the system. These are drugs such as nivolumab or pembrolizumab that you may have seen commercials for or your doctors may have introduced. I'm also going to be talking about cellular therapy, which is depicted on the left. Cellular therapy is quite distinct. Um, and a, there's a little schematic here. Uh, essentially what happens with cellular therapy is uh, it's, it's actually a more laborious process, but, but where immune cells are uh, removed out of the body. And this is done similar to how one would donate blood. So essentially it's kind of like a blood, blood donation, but uh, there's a machine that's able to just pull out the white blood cells and then in the lab, those cells are genetically engineered. So there's something that is introduced into those cells that the hope is that it, it helps them then recognize something, you know, something. And, it, and our vision, as you'll hear about in a few minutes, is to allow the, to basically introduce something that makes those immune cells recognize the ALK, uh, ALK proteins. And so essentially, once you've done that genetic engineering, uh, give a low dose of chemotherapy to, to basically make room for these immune cells and then reintroduce those uh, immune cells with the hope that they'll, within the body, expand and start attacking the cancer. So um, today I'm gonna to be talking about both these immune checkpoint inhibitors as well as the cellular therapy. To begin with immune checkpoint inhibitors, because these are drugs that are already approved in lung cancer. Um, but what we found over, over the last several years is that there are a number of different factors that may either increase the likelihood of, of, a, of a patient responding to those drugs or decrease the likelihood. It's actually very complex and we think it's a mix of um, some, some factors that people are born with, some things that are unique to, to the tumor, some things within the tumor itself, like the, the surrounding environment, as, as well as other external factors like other drugs that, that patients are, are receiving that, that may contribute. What we've learned over the last several years is that um, it seems like out positive lung cancers don't respond to these uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors as well as other forms of lung cancer. And so this is an effort where we're trying to really understand what are the factors that are driving that. And like I said, you know, we think it's likely gonna be a combination of things. And so this is an effort uh, that uh, is being led by Jessica Lynn, one of my colleagues um, at Mass General, where essentially uh, this is, oops, sorry. Oops. Um, this is called the Enigma Plus study. Um, and this is essentially a, a, a virtual consenting. So it's a web-based platform 
um, that uh, would allow any patient uh, within in the United States right now uh, to do a virtual consent. Um, and it would uh, allow us to basically pool clinical information as well as if patients were interested, any archival leftover tumor material for us to study the genetics of it as well as the immune landscape around it using cutting edge uh, uh, transcriptional uh, uh, studies to, to try to get a better sense of what are the factors that may be preventing these immune checkpoint inhibitors from working as well as we would like them to work. Um, so this is a study that is now finally IRB approved and we're in the last uh, legal aspects of getting all of the, the data um, uh, sorted out. So um, we're really excited to finally see that get off the ground. In the last few minutes, I did want to just highlight um, the work on cellular therapy. I, I gave you a background on, on how this works. And in order to actually develop this type of therapy that is uh, allowing us to genetically engineer and put in a receptor that allows immune cells to recognize ALK, one of the first things we have to do is actually find in nature immune cells that are targeting ALK. That is, we need to be able to identify um, and uh, decode the sequence uh, of the ALK T cell receptor. Um, that, that is a critical piece of information to allow us to then develop a therapy like this. And so what this slide shows is really how we're going about this. And so what we're doing is we are taking both healthy donors as well as patients with non-small cell lung cancer, um, ALK fusions as well as other genotypes and basically just having uh, as part of their regular kind of clinical care, we draw an extra tube of blood and we take out the immune cells. And then we're doing uh, large scale screening efforts to find uh, any immune cells that are reacting against ALK in a Petri dish. And then we're trying to isolate the, the receptors that are reacting and then uh, we'll be able to then decode the ALK uh, TCR, the T cell receptor. And so uh, this is uh, meant to show some of the work we've done to date. And just to orient you to this slide, um, on the top, we see different color boxes, purple, uh, blue, green. Um, those represent either blood samples from patients with ALK fusions, ROS1 fusions, other forms of lung cancer, or uh, healthy donors. And then on the far right, um, the column, you see these are actually different components of the ALK uh, fusion protein, different peptides. Um, as well as the bottom, these are some healthy, uh, basically positive controls, things people normally should be re reacting to. Um, and so the, the lavender dots are anytime we're seeing hits, that is, we're finding immune cells there that are reacting against ALK. Uh, so we think this is really encouraging. We actually are finding immune cells that are reacting against ALK. And right now we are in the process of isolating what exactly, uh, what portion of ALK they're reacting to. And then we'll follow that up by validating that in the lab. And this is a critical first step uh, towards ultimately bringing a therapy like this to the clinic. So uh, I know I'm, I'm over time, but I, I uh, wanted to really thank once again, a positive longevity and all of you patients uh, for being here today. And this is, as well as all my colleagues at Mass General uh, for helping make this work possible. And so with that, I uh, look forward to participating in the question and answer session. Thank you so much for that great presentation, Dr. Gaynor. Uh, next, uh, as I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, Dr. Nemanoff is unable to be with us today. So we have Dr. Trevor Bavona from UCSF and Dr. Christine Lovely from Vanderbilt University, and they are doing a collaborative project. And I'll hand it over to Dr. Lovely and Dr. Bavona. It looks like we may need to skip ahead and then come back to Dr. Lovely and Dr. Bavono. Dr. Lovely's having some trouble with her camera. So Colin, who was who was next on your list? 
I think that's me. Okay. Should I share my screen? Oh, yes. So we'll go ahead and hear from Dr. Iafredi next. Thank you. You see that okay? Yes. Yep, that's great. Okay. Um, first, thank you to everyone uh, uh, attending. Thank you for the invitation, Colin and Emily. It's a great it's a great honor to be here. It's a great honor to receive funding to work on these projects. Uh, I'm a pathologist at MGH. Um, I've been fortunate to work on ALK since really just as it was first discovered. Um, I have been very involved in the diagnosis, the development of diagnostics, um, IHC, FISH, sequencing, kind of all the major techniques we, we've, we've, um, we've helped work on over the years. And more recently, my research lab is starting to work on, on therapeutics. I, I would say um, this is a great group we have today. You may not realize uh, they're spectacular clinicians um, and scientists. And I've worked, I think, almost with all of them. And to a person, they're, they're phenomenally nice people. So um, it's just great. It's great to be uh, in a group like this. Um, I'm very honored to, to join. OK, so let, let's jump into our project. Um, I always like to talk a little bit about diagnostics, because that's my training as a pathologist, and maybe give you a little bit of background for those who aren't scientists um, in the maybe step back a little bit into more of the, the very basics of what we're talking about. So um, I'm going to mostly be talking about, you know, EMO4, ALK and lung cancer, but these, these kind of concepts would, would be true for other tumor types. Um, ALK is a receptor kinase. That means it's a protein that sits on the cell surface, the cell membrane. And like many of these family of kinases, their normal role is to provide signals for cell to grow. They receive these secreted protein signals that float around outside the cell if they land onto one of these receptors like ALK. Um, the receptors get the signal that it's okay, time to divide or time to do something. Uh, and that's normally very tightly controlled during development. When the two proteins come together, when they bind these growth factors from the outside, um, something happens, the enzyme, enzymatic activity is activated the kinase domain that you probably all have heard of tyrosine kinase inhibitors, the kinase domain results in a cascade of chemical reactions that re result in phosphorylation, the addition of phosphate groups uh, to the kinase domain, which activates it. That results in a cascade of phosphorylation events downstream of the protein that eventually tells the cell to divide. So that's the normal function of ALK. What happens when you have a fusion? Fusions uh, are fascinating. We still don't fully understand uh, I think Dr. Chiarle is, is an expert in, in looking at this uh, kind of rearrangements in the development of the immune system. Some cells in our body do rearrange their genes, but most don't, certainly lung cancer cells. Uh, the no, I'm sorry, lung cells, the normal cells, don't rearrange their, their chromosomes. But for whatever reason that we don't fully understand, um, it happens occasionally that the chromosomes are rearranged in our cells. And if it happens, in the right way, or maybe we could call it the wrong way, um, two genes that normally are separate, right? They're separate proteins. They're separate pieces of DNA on, on separate parts of our genome uh, are fused together. Um, and these can create, create a fusion protein. That is two halves or halves of two different proteins come together and those create things like EMO4-ALK. When these come together, um, not all of them, but most of the time, they're, they're not expressed on the cell surface anymore, and they just come together and they create this phosphorylation signaling cascade by themselves. They don't need any signal or any, anything else. The cells themselves have a signal internal to them that tells it to divide and divide and divide. And really, that's the basis of cancer in, the, in these cells, right? There is a, a gene fusion always on, tells the cell to divide. Okay. So skipping quickly to drug development, most of the drugs, many of the drugs in lung cancer, the targeted therapy and personalized medicine that we've heard a little bit about, um, have been focused on inhibiting the enzymatic activity itself, what's called the kinase domain or the kinase activity, uh, developing drugs that come into that part of the protein and bind to it, 
uh, and block that activity. If you can block those phosphate cascades from happening, you can kill or slow down, kill the cells or slow the development of the tumor. Multiple generations of these drugs have been developed. I don't need to tell this audience about, about that. We've studied the development of resistance, of course, mutations that, that uh, prevent some of those drugs from working and developing new drugs. But all of them have largely been focused on tyrosine kinase inhibitors, this kind of family of kinase inhibitors. You've heard a little bit about using immune methodologies, and I think the exciting part about that is they're approaching these tumors from a different therapeutic mechanism of action, and I think that's clearly why it's so exciting. We've worked hard on tyrosine kinase inhibitors. We have to try a few other things to see longer and longer-term survival in patients. So that's the immune, the immune approach. Are there small molecule approach? That is, you know, pill, drug, uh, small molecule pill approaches um, that would attack the EMO4 alloc protein itself that are not tyrosine kinase inhibitors. There probably are. Uh, they're more difficult to develop. But their possibility of doing other things to this protein, you can block um, these proteins from coming together, which is important for their function, dimerization. You can induce the degradation of the fusion protein. An area of uh, very high level interest in oncology right now is using the cell's normal machinery to degrade proteins, right? Because you, you can't, proteins don't live forever. They have to be turned over. So if you can induce these proteins specifically to get degraded and turned over, you, you might do something nice. And then you might also, you know, maybe not degrade the whole protein that is get rid of it, but maybe just cause, cause that local domain to unfold. And how do we do that? There are a number of approaches. The approach that we're taking and our project is together with Lee Rod bar Pallette, who's a chemical biologist at Mass General, a very brilliant young scientist, um, uh, is using, uh, taking advantage of a class of drugs that bind to the amino acid cysteine, as you probably Remember or may not remember from high school chemistry, there are 20 amino acids. Cysteine is one of those is present in almost all of our proteins, many of our proteins. They're critical for enzymatic functions. They're critical for many of our proteins that bind and coordinate metals like zinc or iron. Those cysteines are the critical amino acids there. Uh, they're involved in uh, modifications that allow proteins to bind to the cell surface. And probably most importantly, the cysteines are critical in the structure of many, many proteins. Two cysteines come together and they bind in what's called a covalent bond. So this is a kind of permanent, unbreakable bond. They're, they're, they can be breakable with, with uh, chemical means, but they're, they're very stable uh, bonds. And so what we're trying to do is almost recapitulate this with drugs. These cysteine reactive drugs can bind in an unbreakable way with the protein. And that's a lot different than all the other drugs that we've used that are so-called competitive. That is, they, they come, they bind temporarily, and they go away. These would be, boom, they stick there. And there, there's quite a few of these now being developed in, um, in cancer therapeutics. They're some of our best drugs in, in a variety of, of tumor types, so an area of intense interest. Um, I won't go into the details of what Miron's lab does, other than to give you an overview. It involves really cool science, things like mass spectrometry and all kinds of things like that. But what we're looking for is taking cells, tumor cells, and finding, asking a question of all the cells uh, or all the proteins in those cells, which one of them uh, have cysteines that we can bind to? Not all cysteines can be, quote, druggable. They have to be open and available and reactive. And he developed this technique, this phenomenal technique, which allows you to map across all proteins which ones are, are uh, druggable with these cysteine compounds. And we're actively doing that right now in the ALK positive tumors. That's, that's a major part of our proposal. AIM-1 is essentially looking in the ALK, ALK tumors for what are the reactive um, proteins and then making some conclusions about that. We're hoping that perhaps emo 4 ALK itself is reactive. And so those, you know, that would be the best target, but all the other targets that we're discovering might have an impact on tumor growth. We use two cell lines generally used by the entire uh, field of research. Um, these are known emo 4 out cell lines. They have slightly different out translocations. And the data we already have looks something like this. Again, each of, we're looking across the entire proteome. Each of these dots uh, is a single pro protein within the proteome. And so we map those that are black, which are the cysteines that don't react, and the ones in red are reactive, and the ones at the very top are the most reactive. So now we have a list. Um, in these two ALK cell lines, and we're going to begin to do ALK patient samples as well, finding out who are the reactive cysteines 
And you can begin to map them, as I said, we have a list of about 500 um, cysteines in the proteome that are reactive in both, um, that are present in both of the alpha cell lines. And we're very excited to look at those. You can map them with the functions that are enriched in that population. And also, are there any interesting genes that we knew ahead of time that we really wanted to focus on for drug development? So that's part of the project. The second part is, is actually a, what's called a high throughput screen, which is taking libraries, that is large numbers of these cysteine reactive compounds with different structures, slightly different reactivities, and testing them to see if they can inhibit these phosphorylation cascades. And we do that in plates, and then we, we use things called like Western blots to determine whether those drugs inhibit the phosphorylation cascade. We do this as a pool of 10, 10 compounds per tube, and then if we get a hit, that is one of the pools works, then we look at each drug individually. And it looks a little bit like this. Um, maybe don't look at all of the lanes, just look at this top, this top band here. This is an example of 10, uh, nine pools, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And here's lorlotinib. This is the effect of lorlotinib on the phosphorylation of alk. You can see it, it just completely gets rid of it. So this is our control. And this pool also showed the same thing. All the other pools still showed the phosphorylation is still there. This, this dark band means it's still there. So that's great. We got a hit. Then we expand the library to look at the individual compounds within there. And number seven in pool seven uh, actually shows what we want, which is the inhibition of phosphoalk. And so that's what the screen is currently looking at, where once we get these set of hits, we then come to look um, at uh, within engineered proteins to look for those proteins that have resistance mutations to, let's say, lorlotinib, um, electinib, or, or any of the other uh, ALK inhibitors. And we see, do they inhibit the phosphorylation of those uh, mutant proteins that are resistant to other TKIs? And the hope is we'll identify compounds that still work in the presence of resistance. Uh, we've used some really uh, cool techniques to engineer this. So we use uh, gene, um, genome, gene engineering, genome engineering, CRISPR, um, uh, base editing, essentially to make the mutations all using the same original cell line. We come in and we engineer that line to have all of the possible resistance mutations all on the same background, which makes it really easy to compare in a scientific way across all of those different, um, different resistance mutations. So that's where we are in our progress. I've kind of described the three aims of what we're doing, and we've, we've made, I think, pretty good progress across, across those, those aims. Um, it's a collaboration between two labs. Um, I owe a um, huge thanks to Diane Yang, a stellar postdoc in the lab who's carried all of this, works incredibly hard. Um, the scientists on the call, they know what a Western blot type drug screen is, and it's, a hu it's just a huge amount of hard, hard work. And so she's, she's done that with Diane Yang, a stellar technician. And then here's Lee Ron. This is Lee Ron's lab, uh, and Alex and Abby in his lab have been phenomenal collaborators. So... Thank you for your uh, support and uh, looking forward to the question and answer period. Thank you so much, Dr. Iafrady. Um, this is a real challenge for us to present uh, something that at one level is understandable by people that are very new to cancer. And then at the other end, I know we've got people that are very deeply into the science. And uh, so, uh, Dr. Iafredi and Kiali and Lovely and Dagogo Jack, I love them. They're, they're nerds. I love nerds because they're making science move ahead and uh, we wouldn't be alive without uh, all these wonderful, they're nerds, but they're wonderful people. As Dr. Iafredi said, they're really, uh, I've interacted with these uh, do great doctors and they're to a fault, uh, all wonderful to work with. So thank you so, so much. Uh, next, we have uh, hopefully back online Dr. Bavona and Dr. Lovely, and they'll be presenting uh, some information about the study that they started in 2019, and uh, we look forward to hearing from them. So I'll let you take it away. Yes, I'm back on. This is Trevor Bavona. So. Well, hi, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. Trevor, um, before we get going, um, do you want to go first or you want me to go first? Uh, go, ahead. go ahead, please. So hi, everyone. Thank you for spending your Saturday with us. It's really a pleasure to be here. Sorry for the brief technical issue. Um, I'm delighted to be part of this discussion today and hope to see everyone again later um, at one of the afternoon discussions around therapies post lorlatinib because that's really near and dear to my heart and thinking about how we study ALK in the lab. 
Um, and so Trevor and I, um, in 2019, sort of right before the pandemic started, uh, got together with the ALK group, and we are so deeply grateful for the support that we've received, both in terms of our laboratory work, but then in just bringing community to our labs. And really, really, really appreciate being part of the ALK family and hope to see you all again in person in the not too distant future. I have to say, uh, um, being at the in-person summit in 2019 in Atlanta was one of the highlights of my year that year. Um, and I really look forward to being able to see everyone in person again in the, in the not too distant future. So I just have a few slides. I'll take maybe five minutes. So five minutes for me and, and five minutes for Trevor. And I will say as scientists, we love to talk about our science. Um, and, and I love that Colin pointed out, there's all different levels of people who are coming to this table today, which is great. There's 308 people signed in right now. That's amazing. And so um, we'll have time for question and answer. I'm, I'm gonna try to be broad uh, in, in talking about principles and then be specific in talking about some um, specific areas of data. And so I'm gonna share my screen. So very broadly speaking, Trevor and I are interested in the non-mutational processes that drive ALK-TKI resistance. Um, and what does that mean? And I'm sorry, I should have paused and introduced myself a little bit more. So my name is Christine Lovely. I, um, I work at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, it's a beautiful place. Hope anyone can come and visit. Would love to see you all. I've seen several people from the group recently and it's just a joy every time. So. Uh, I want to start also by saying we love to have visitors in our lab and really consider this very, very much patient partnered research. So this is a group that came to my lab um, right before the pandemic started. We took a tour of, of not just my research laboratory, but several of the what we call core research labs at Vanderbilt where you know, really specialized um, equipment is present that we used for the research. And we just had a blast that day sharing science um, with patients and advocates and recognize that not everyone has been to a research lab. If you ever have the opportunity to visit, um, we, we would love to have you come and visit the lab. So very broadly speaking, uh, we started with a question, which is how do ALK positive tumor cells rewire themselves to be able to grow even in the presence of ALK-TKI therapy? So this is something, you know, whether you're a physician, a patient, a family member, we all experience. Patients go on, you know, ALK TKIs, prosotinib, electinib, brigatinib, all of them that we have right now. And sometimes they work great, but at some point in the future, the drug all of a sudden stops working. And we pause and say, what happened? Why did that tumor cell stop responding to the drug? And let me make an analogy for you. Again, this is a, a huge audience and people have lots of levels of experience with uh, where we're at in science. And so, Let's imagine a scenario where you're at work and you wanna drive home. And so this is pretty simple. Here's the car, there's one road going to the home. What if there's a block? What if there's an accident? What if one of the roads closed? What happens? How do you get home? So at the end of the day, you really wanna get home. The road is blocked, what do you do? Well, you take a detour. So you just find a different way, different roads to get to the ultimate destination, which is your home. Well, tumor cells do exactly the same thing. ALK positive tumor cells, their favorite road to get home, and for them getting home means growing. They, they wanna grow, they wanna spread. They, the, when tumor cells, when that pathway and the ALK pathway is blocked and they can't get to their home, which is growing, they're gonna find a detour, a way around it. So when the ALK TKI is present, the tumor cell is gonna to start to think of itself, how do I rewire myself? How do I figure out a detour pathway to actually get to where I wanna go? And where the tumor cell wants to go is, it just wants to grow. It wants to do all of the nasty things that cancer does, grow and spread. Um, and that's really what we're interested in. This is cellular rewiring that tumor cells experience. We usually think about this as mutations within the ALK kinase domain that develop on therapy. So here's an example of one of my patients. She developed, um, had a great response to chrysotinib lasting about 14 months and then um, had growth in um, lesions in her liver seen here on the CT scan with this red arrow. And when we took a rebiopsy of her tumor, she had a new mutation in ALK, one that you've probably all heard of called ALK G1202R. Well, fast forward an enormous amount of work by several of the people who are on, on this call today and just huge number of patients contributing their samples. We have multiple now studies showing, and this is um, just one example of a uh, a phase one, two clinical trial of a drug called Ensartanib, 
where we look in the blood of patients who develop uh, acquired resistance to any ALK TKI, and we try to find these mutations within the ALK kinase domain that may uh, cause the acquired drug resistance. We, again, one more slide. We, you know, we look at this in many, many different ways, and I'm just showing you this because I think this is a paradigm that we all think about and feel very comfortable with, which is in this case, this patient was on crizotinib um, and went, then enrolled at, at the time of resistance to crizotinib to uh, a clinical trial with a drug called insartinib. Um, this is all um, patient-level data that was really done by a very talented undergraduate student um, named Vincent from my lab. This patient, when they started on insartinib, they had a mutation L1152V that went away with insartinib. Um, but then on, when the patient became resistant to insartinib, they developed a new ALK mutation, this ALK E1210K shown here in blue. So we feel very comfortable in the clinic um, looking for these ALK mutations, finding out, you know, are they causing resistance? And we have you know, more than 20 different ALK mutations that cause resistance. But that's clearly not the end of the story. Oh, I'm sorry, one more slide. This is just a spectrum of all the different mutations that were found in patients on this particular clinical trial. ALK mutations are clearly not the end of the story. So new DNA level mutations do not explain all cases of acquired resistance to ALK TKI therapy. So we really wanna know are what other changes do tumor cells undergo to be able to escape the effects of ALK TKI therapy. Remember, the tumor wants to get home and the tumor's home is to grow. So it's gonna find a way, it's gonna find detour pathways to get to where it wants to go, which is to just get grow and be able to metastasize and spread. So what other changes do tumor cells do that are not new mutations in the DNA? Or in other words, can we find the detour pathways that tumor cells take to overcome the effects of the ALK inhibitor therapy? And I would just close this slide by saying, like viruses, so right now in our media, you're hearing a lot about the COVID-19 Delta variant and how that virus has evolved and changed and become more efficient at doing what it wants to do which is infect hosts. Well, tumor cells evolve in very similar ways. The tumor cells rewire and evolve to overcome any pressure that they're experiencing. And that pressure may be drugs, it may be an immune attack, whatever the tumor experiences that's gonna prevent it from growing, it's gonna to try to figure out a detour to get around that blockade. Hope that makes sense. And so we were very interested in thinking about how do the tumor cells rewire? What are other pathways that the tumor cells use, other roads the tumor cells use, if you will, to be able to escape ALK TKI therapy? Now I'm going to get into a little bit more of the nitty gritty science. So this was work done by a postdoc in my lab, uh, lab named Juan. We took ALK positive cells that were resistant to all six ALK TKIs, five of them that are FDA approved, plus insartinib, which is not yet FDA approved. And we did something called transcriptomic signaling or transcriptomic sequencing where instead of looking at the DNA, we looked at RNA and RNA is the message. So we can look at thousands of genes at the same time and ask, okay, with this really sophisticated sequencing, how are these tumor cells rewiring to overcome the effects of all six of these alpha TKIs? From that, um, we picked out a few of our favorite targets. And again, this is where we get into a little bit of the more nitty gritty science, but I'm gonna talk you through it. Um, let me see if I can put my pointer on, actually. Maybe. Sorry, I'm trying to get, oh, here's an arrow. Hopefully you can all see my arrow. So we picked out a couple of our favorite targets, and one of them is a, is a protein called clusterin. And what I want you to see here is H3122. This is an ALK positive cell line that is sensitive to all ALK TKIs, prothotinib, electinib, thuritinib, regatinib, uh, lorlatinib, and sartinib. And this, these are ALK positive cell lines that are resistant to crizotinib, electinib, lorlatinib, and sartinib, regatinib. Um, so we've modeled all of these resistance in tumor cells in the lab. And what you can see here is compared to the ALK positive drug sensitive cells, the first lane, if you look here, the first, this is a Western blot. The first lane, there's basically no signal. You don't see any black blob here. But in these resistant cells, then this lane where my arrow is, the next, the next, the next, next, you see this black signal. Sorry, that's my dog. Hey, be quiet. Um, 
here, this is a protein called clostridium. You can see this massive change from where the cells are sensitive to the drug to when the cells are resistant to the drug. And th this protein gets upregulated in the resistant cells. And this protein is something called clostridium that we found from this um, transcriptomic analysis, looking at all of the signals in the cell. What we found next was, oops, sorry, I can't advance my slides with the pointer on. When we took this protein cluster in and we knocked it down, so we just engineered the cells to not express this protein anymore. What we found was, so here's the protein cluster in, and here's where we engineered the cells to knock it down. So basically we took cells that express a ton of cluster in, and then we just got rid of the cluster in, simple as that. And when we got rid of the cluster in, the cells were more sensitive to the ALK TKI. So here, let me show you, in this first lane, these are cells treated with ALK TKI in the, in the presence of clostridium. And then when we got rid of clostridium, here are these two, the cells actually had a better response to ALK TKI therapy. And we did that in multiple different um, cell lines, in multiple different ALK TKI. So this is crizotinib, this is lorlatinib, and even in the lorlatinib resistant cells, you can see when we got rid of clostridium, these two lanes here, no more pro clostridium protein, the cells actually grew better um, or sorry, the cells died more with the ALK TKI present. So again, a lot of granular data. I'm going to go through this quickly, but would love, love, love to chat with you more about it. What we actually found is that this is, clostridium is one way that cells adapt or rewire to ALK TKI therapy. So here's four different ALK positive cell lines. These are all cell lines that are sensitive. They respond to ALK TKI therapy. We looked at every single ALK TKI PKI, crizotinib, electinib, seritinib, brigatinib, lorlatinib, and sartinib. In every single case, when you take the sensitive cells, the drug sensitive cells, shown here where my pointer is, there's very little clusterin. When you treat them with the ALK inhibitor, even just 24 hours after treatment, you see this upregulation of this cell called clusterin. And what clusterin actually turns out to be is a protein that protects cells from undergoing programmed cell death or apoptosis. And so it's a protection factor. The tumor cells are upregulating this protein that protects them from dying. And we want the tumor cells to die. So we don't want the cells, the tumor cells, to evolve these protection mechanisms to um, block against death. We want more tumor death. And so how do we look at this? Again, this is an ALK positive tumor cell line where we um, knocked down or got rid of the clustering gene genetically. Um, when we got rid of it here, so here's the normal ALK cells grown in electinib alone. When we get rid of clostridium, just knock it out, get rid of that protein altogether, the cells die much more in the presence of electinib. So this bar here, electinib alone, this bar here, electinib plus getting rid of clostridium. And here's just another way to look at this. This is a, a, an experiment where we actually looked at what we call programmed cell death or apoptosis. And the take home message is when you treat cells with an ALK inhibitor and you knock down cluster and you get rid of that cluster and protein, the cells die more. And that's exactly what we want to happen. Well, coincidentally, and this is just such a phenomenal story, um, it shows really, I think, the uh, amazing partnerships that we can have together is there's a company called Alethea Biotherapeutics that actually now has a, a drug, an antibody drug against cluster. And with the research committee, Colin, Ricardo, myself, we've had several conversations with Alethea to be able to really bring this drug into the ALK world uh, for preclinical studies. And I've already started to talk about how do we then make this into a clinical trial for patients uh, with ALK. I will stop there. Really look forward to the Q&A session. Thank you so much for listening. And I will turn over to Dr. Bavona. Well, thanks, Christine. That's wonderful. Um, and uh, I want to emphasize uh, and echo Christine's uh, sentiments that uh, it's been a wonderful opportunity to collaborate with you all uh, and to work with Christine. Christine and I have worked together for many, many years, uh, even predating uh, you know this um, you know this particular uh, project and grant. Um, so what I thought I'd do is uh, um, uh, not um, go over a lot of introduction that uh, Christine uh, already um, uh, nicely. Uh, articulated and share a few slides here on some of our findings. Let's see.
Okay, are you able to see the slides? Yes, yep. Let's see here. Okay, so what, are, what we're focused on um, uh, in, in, in many projects, including this one, is overcoming resistance and enhancing response to, to various targeted therapies, in particular here, uh, ALK targeted therapies. And so what I wanna highlight is that one of these protective pathways that, that we've been focused on in, in parallel with Christine uh, and the pathway she described is, is a different um, mechanism by which uh, um, ALK positive cancer cells can survive therapy. Uh, and of course, as Christine uh, noted, the important point, we don't want them to survive therapy. We want them to die when they're treated with ALK inhibitors. And so th this is a, an experiment that we did looking at how um, cells respond to an initial treatment with an ALK inhibitor. And so it's shown in the middle of the slide are two uh, cell lines, odd positive um, lung cancer cell lines, one of which was provided um, by Christine to us, STE1, that she generated from a patient uh, at Vanderbilt. And what we're looking at here is a particular protein called YAP, which is a very important um, uh, uh, survival protein in cells. This, this is a protein that can help uh, cancer cells survive in various contexts. And what's important uh, to note here is that this is one of the pathways that is activated very early on when ALK positive cancer cells are treated with an ALK inhibitor. So shown in the red box is treatment of these two ALK positive cell lines with electinin. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, a darkening of the bands on these Western blots here over four to 18 days. So early on into therapy. And so this, um, uh, this is a marker of YAP activation. This is the amount of YAP that's in the nucleus, which is where it does its job in cancer cells. Um, and it helps to turn on uh, uh, genes that, that again, uh, promote cancer cell survival. So this pathway um, is, is, um, is interesting because there are uh, now clinically um, uh, available YAP inhibitors that are being developed by, uh, by uh, biotech companies, including one that we're collaborating with here at San Francisco. And, um, and so the, the concept here is that these cells tolerate ALK inhibitors uh, by various mechanisms, and one of which we think is this YAP, um, this YAP uh, activation pathway. And so one hypothesis then is if you block YAP, we might be able to enhance response to to ALK inhibitors. And I should say, going back um, one slide, this is a, um, a, a, a pathway that seems to be active across different driver proteins and oncogenes, EGFR, KRAS, and, and others. So an example where studying ALK can also potentially improve our, our knowledge and, and potentially even treatment of, of other types of lung cancer as well. Um, so we tested this hypothesis that blocking YAP might enhance response. And in fact, using genetic knockdown studies that, that many have already described today, uh, we can show that in fact, um, in these various models, here's another ALK model on the right, H228 cells, uh, that block knocking YAP down does enhance response to electin treatment and also to brigatinib and others that I'm not showing here. And again, similar findings were across other um, cell line models like EGFR mutations as well. Uh, and we've expanded this out now to, to looking at uh, various other models and, and doing long-term experiments. And what we can say, show is that uh, again, blocking this protein can really enhance response not only in, in cells grown in the lab in, in, uh, in a dish, uh, but also in tumors in mice, and, and those are ongoing. And we currently just started uh, last month uh, uh, treating with those YAP inhibitors that I alluded to, uh, that were provided to us by, um, by Bachi Therapeutics here in San Francisco, and those are actually in phase one clinical trials uh, right now. So we hope to um, hopefully show enhanced response against odd positive cancers, and the company's very open to thinking about a clinical trial as well. And then I want to switch gears just a little bit um, in, uh, over the next couple of minutes to tell you about uh, a parallel project um, that actually started with a collaboration with Christine many years ago that we published in 2015, where we were studying how ALK fusions um, uh, activate cancer cell signaling pathways to promote cancer growth. And so um, in, in that study with Christine's group, we noted that when we looked at the ALK positive cells as to where ALK was located, it was located in these um, uh, cytoplasmic structures, these, these puncti, you can see hopefully here, um, you can see my cursor, um, these, these blobs sort of in the cytoplasm. And these were actually functional. When we dissolved those, those blobs, um, it actually prevented the cancer cells from, from signaling um, and from growing. And so um, over the next few years of, um, after that study, we, we took on the question of what are those um, and how are they important or are they important to, um, to ALK positive cancer cell growth? And so um, it turns out, uh, and I'm gonna summarize uh, five years of work here in about two minutes, um, that uh, when we look at out positive cells, again, here's that H3122 cell line that Christine and others described, um, we can, we can uh, see that the endogenous ALK fusion, again, is localized to these cytoplasmic um, uh, puncti, these structures. 
And through a lot of uh, biophysical and, and other studies, uh, uh, we, um, uh, uh, we actually figured out what these are. And uh, these are actually membraneless protein granules. Um, and uh, what they look like at high resolution is shown on the right. This is super resolution imaging uh, done uh, with a collaboration uh, with a biophysicist here at UCSF, Bo Wang. And you can see these are quite interesting structures. They're, they're, um, uh, they're serpiginous, uh, they're porous. Um, and they're, and they're semi-solid. So they sort of actually separate out into the cytosol of, of these cells. They form their own organelle essentially. And so um, I'm gonna uh, summarize the cartoon form here, uh, a recent publication we had that described uh, how these form, how they recruit signaling proteins like SHIP2 and SHIC and GRAB and SOS to activate cancer cell signaling pathways like the ras map kinase pathway. And why this is important, uh, we think, um, uh, 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 might be of interest to this audience is that many of these proteins that um, that are recruited here to the ALK uh, 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 cytoplasmic granules are actually targetable with existing drugs uh, in the clinic, SHIP2 inhibitors, uh, GRAB2 SOS inhibitors, and others. And so uh, what we have started to, uh, to explore is, are those proteins actually important not only for the signaling, but the formation of the structure? Um, and um, several are actually. So for example, if we knock out GRAB2 in cells, that structure that ALK fusions form, um, uh, it uh, uh, dissolves. So you go from the picture on the left to the picture on the right. Uh, and so uh, in principle, what that means is that uh, inhibitors of GRAB2, again, which exist uh, in, in uh, clinical trials, uh, might be able to do the same thing. And so that's a therapeutic hypothesis that we're just exploring. And we're doing the same in parallel with SHIP2 inhibitors uh, and others. And so we hope to uh, provide proof of concept for some uh, novel approaches to treating ALK positive uh, cancers, not only those that are drug resistant, uh, potentially even those that are drug sensitive. And so with that, I want to acknowledge, um, uh, of course, uh, the wonderful collaboration with Christine, exploring how these uh, cancers can be better targeted through various pathways that, that we're working on uh, together and in parallel, um, and also um, acknowledge a, a large team effort that uh, was involved in, in the granular work um, uh, shown here. Thank you very much. You've got some really exciting research going on there, Dr. Bavona and Dr. Lovely. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's just the, the scientists that we have doing the research for Out Positive, they're truly the leaders in the world. They really are the most brilliant minds. And we're so proud to count you as part of our team and our family. So thank you so much. Uh, another brilliant mind, and uh, this isn't me saying it, this is many people I've heard this from, is Dr. Dagogo Jack. And I'll hand it over to Dr. Dagogo Jack to introduce herself and then talk about the research that she's doing. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Idi Dagogo Jack. I'm a thoracic oncologist or lung cancer specialist here at Mass General. So I work with Drs. Gaynor but, and Dr. Ayafrady, but also have worked closely with Dr. Wad and others, and then work very closely with Dr. Lovely as well. So the lung cancer community is very much a community. And so uh, thank you all. So last year I was funded uh, by ALK Positive, so all of you, as well as Longevity, to support a clinical trial that is working towards kind of addressing those uh, detours that Dr. Lovely was talking about, bypass signals or ALK independent resistance. And so I, in the last year or so, I think the virtual world has allowed us to serve on kind of many panels, go to many meetings. And one thing I always find striking is when people kind of start talks by discussing why they do what they do and what brought them to doing it. And, and so when Colin and Emily sent us a template for this talk, they suggested maybe it would be a good opportunity to discuss that. And so I think that what kind of separates my talk that I'm about to talk about versus the other talks is that I, those talks are very, very exciting. We need future therapies, but I think we also need therapies now to bridge us to get to those very exciting therapies that Dr. Lovely, Dr. Bavona, Dr. Ayafrady, Dr. Gaynor, Dr. Awad, um, and Dr. Carley have talked about. And so this project and this grant is really focusing on how can we attempt to overcome what we see right now in the clinic to get us to these other therapies. And so I wanted to start with my why. And so my why actually starts back in Vanderbilt as uh, Dr. Lovely is there and I'm jealous every moment she discusses being at Vanderbilt. But when I was in Vanderbilt back in 2000, I was in the middle of my time in Vanderbilt back in 2008, my best friend's mom at the, in her mid forties got diagnosed with lung cancer. And she passed away pretty quickly from the lung cancer. And we were all very shocked. 
because this was before we were doing routine molecular testing. This was before we had uh, all our targeted therapies. And so I, I was very uh, shocked because this wasn't a context where I had thought about lung cancer. And so it really kind of gave me passion at that time to learn all I could about lung cancer and made a promise to my friend back then. She said, you don't have to hold it up. But I said, you know, I want to study cancer anyway, and I want to we'll work together to try to figure out what's going on. And so to me, I, it has been very encouraging to see in the last decade to decade and a half, the tremendous progress that has really been made in that period of time and to meet all these kind of exciting collaborators and also exciting mentors and Alice Shaw that have kind of ultimately culminated in this particular research project. And so this research project, as mentioned, is focusing on ALK independent resistance. I know that to all of us, ALK independent resistance doesn't mean the same thing. So I thought that I would start by discussing kind of what I mean by that term. And so for the last decade or so, we've seen multiple different therapies emerge for treatment of ALK positive lung cancer, and they have for the most part focused on one aim. How can we build a bigger, not bigger, but a better, more potent ALK inhibitor? And so we've gone from crizotinib to lorlatinib, and we've done pretty well. We've successfully targeted ALK. But what we're finding is that regardless of what all of us hope, the cancer eventually develops resistance. And when we study resistance, we broadly categorize resistance into two categories, ALK dependent resistance and ALK independent resistance. But as you've learned from Dr. Lovely and, uh, and Dr. Bavona and others, it can be more complicated than that. But I think starting with this basic framework is, is useful for thinking about our current clinical trial. And so when we study ALK, uh, uh, resistance after second generation ALK TKI, so that's electinib, brigatinib, seritinib, drugs like insartinib, and then after lorlatinib, we see a couple of themes emerge. So ALK dependent resistance, that is getting a new uh, alteration or typically a mutation in the ALK protein or gene, uh, tends to emerge in about 50 to 60 percent of tumors that are resistant to second generation ALK inhibitors, but it's less common with lorlatinib. We see it in about 25 to a third of cases. And so what that means is that the majority of tumors or a significant proportion of tumors that have become resistant or started growing on these drugs are getting survival signals for things, from things that are not ALK. And so we have spent kind of us and others and kind of the community work that you've just heard about uh, have spent time trying to study what are these uh, growth signals that the cancers are dependent on and can we target them? And can we find specifically key growth signals that may be at play in a variety of tumors that we can uh, put into the clinic and have kind of broad effect across multiple patients? And so that work has led us to identify amplification or extra copies of a gene called MET in about, 10, about 15 to 20% of tumors that have uh, become resistant to a second generation ALK targeted therapy or lorlatinib. And then in the remaining tumors outlined in the gray, we see a variety of different growth signals. And sometimes we don't find a growth signal as and that's really what prompts work by Dr. Lovely, Dr. Pavona and others to look beyond mutational mechanisms. And so, we know now that you know to overcome this type of resistance, we can't just make a better ALK pill. We have to think about combinations and think about other strategies. And so for us in thinking about those other strategies, it always kind of brings us back to the biology. And so when we think about uh, ALK signaling, right, we tend to say ALK is the most critical protein for ALK signaling in ALK positive lung cancers. But ALK doesn't work alone. In the same way that we espouse and kind of embody team science, uh, cancers to grow, they really need a big team. They need uh, multiple, it's basically a cascade or an assembly line of proteins that help ALK positive lung cancers grow and survive. I've, I've kind of highlighted a few of those key proteins here, just to highlight that in a sensitive tumor cell, so when an ALK positive lung cancer is first diagnosed or still responding to ALK pills, blocking ALK alone is usually quite successful at shutting down most of these growth signals. When you develop ALK independent resistance, what happens is that you may shut down those signals or shut down ALK, but they get turned back on by, for example, in the context of MET amplification, they get turned back on by kind of having excess copies of that MET gene. In this particular context, you need to target both ALK and MET to have any kind of uh, success. But we've learned that that's only kind of 15 to 20 percent of cases of uh, or, or tumor specimens that are resistant, that have developed ALK independent resistance where that applies. Fortunately, we, we do think that even if it's not MET driven, like when there are other growth signals that may be driving bypass 
pathway signaling or ALK independent resistance, they do tend to uh, use similar proteins. And so with that in mind, this particular clinical trial is targeting uh, three key areas or three key proteins that we think might be important now. And those are targeting MET, targeting SHIP2, which is a protein that works, uh, Dr. Bivona actually just mentioned, that works very closely with RAS and this MAPK pathway here. We're also targeting a protein more downstream uh, called MEC. And these three combinations are actually currently available, it, pairing kind of lorlatinib with a MET inhibitor, lorlatinib with a MEC inhibitor, and lorlatinib with a SHIP2 inhibitor in a current clinical trial. And that clinical trial is a phase one, two clinical trial, and we're still in the phase one component where we're finding what is the right dose to give, what is the safest dose to give of these three combinations. And we hope to expand to the phase two where we actually have the right dose, and now we can figure out how effective it is. How, how does it make the cancer shrink? How long do people respond to it? And we've also paired uh, liquid biopsies and tissue biopsies to study, kind of, to identify what makes a tumor respond or resist this particular combination to help us better select patients for these therapies moving forward. And, and this is very much a kind of a dynamic or a kind of a, a living trial in the sense that we're working very closely with Aaron Hada's lab here at Mass General to try to identify other promising combinations with the intent of slotting them in in the future if we thought that uh, they were emerging as a, a very common or recurrent bypass pathway. And so I, I want to thank you all on behalf of me and also on behalf of all of the people who were part of the clinical trials uh, machine here at Mass General. These are our research nurses, our uh, regulatory coordinators, our physicians here, our laboratory scientists. And especially thank you all, because we can't have these clinical trials without your participation. And, and for this particular uh, clinical trials, it means so much to me that your support is actually helping propel and kind of making this clinical trial possible. And so with that in mind, I, am, I hopefully gave you guys back two minutes or so for a lot of questions and happy to answer any questions you may have about the clinical trial and how it's going. Thank you so much, Dr. Dugogo Jack. Fantastic presentation. Uh, just want to let everyone know the fundraising that you've been doing over the last years has really accelerated ALK research. There's so much lung cancer research that goes on that doesn't have anything specific to do with ALK and uh, by doing fundraising specifically for our research, you're really pushing the boundaries and making it happen much, much quicker. So uh, that's what it's all about is uh, getting us to have better therapies sooner. And uh, there's lots of great questions. I'm sure we're not gonna have time for all of the questions to get answered, but I'm gonna let Emily start asking some of the questions to the doctors and uh, look forward to hearing the questions and the answers. Sure, so I'll start with one that, that is in the Q&A section from Dr. Marusek, and he is wondering about the different combinations with ALK TKI that you all have been talking about. So things like YAP, Clusterin, SHIP2, are any of these combinations uh, able to eliminate what's called residual disease? So what's left over after the initial treatment with uh, the first TKI? Do you know whether any of those will, will do that and really just eliminate all of the cancer. I'll start. So hi, thank you. That's a great question. And I think one that we think a lot about for ALK positive lung cancer, for any type of lung cancer, because we see patients treated with ALK TKI therapy or chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and call it a success when the tumor has shrunk by 70%, but then that means there's still 30% of the tumor is still there. And how do we get rid of that what we call minimal residual disease. Um, our goal is, you know, ultimately for all of us, we want to treat patients and shrink their tumors from a hundred by a hundred percent. So there, there is no evidence of, of um, disease present on the scans. I think there's a big difference between testing combinations in animal studies and in cell lines versus in patients. And so it is a, a lot easier to eliminate um, this uh, minimal residual disease or clean up the tumor cells that exist even after the best response to the ALK inhibitor in cell lines or in animals than it is in patients for complicated reasons that have to do with you know, drug dosing and drug availability. Really, I think the, the best things we can do is, is just try to bring combinations to the clinic, build 
really rigorous correlative studies alongside those trials. So if the trial works, we understand why. If the trial doesn't work, we understand why. Because mm -hmm. no number of animal studies or tumor cell line studies, those are great, and that's what we can do in the laboratory. But I would say, ultimately, we have to bring our best combinations forward to be able to test them in the clinic so we can get the answer that we're all looking for. Thank you. Anyone else have a comment on that? I think without going too deep into cancer cell biology, there, you know, there's a common concept that there are always a group of cells that are either quiescent, kind of sitting quietly by, who aren't killed. It can be in kind of a different cell state. And there's a lot of active research. I think everyone knows about the existence of these kind of cells from patients, but also in the Petri dish, we see them. There's always a few cells left over. And so it's an active, it's a very difficult, but very active area of research. And, you know, I think to get to what this question was asking, can you, how do you kill all the cells? Combination is definitely going to be one step, but I think we still need basic research to figure out more of what are those cells, what's making those cells resistant. Um, it's not, we don't think it's mutation um, in those groups. We think it's probably some, some cell state, some cell differentiation state. You can kind of move them out of that quiet state into a susceptible state. We've, I think we're, we've all thought about it and many of us have worked on that problem, but it, it remains a difficult one. And I, I noticed in, in the chat, someone had uh, you know, raised the role of radiation there. And I, I think that's actually an excellent point. And I think that that is something that you know, we, we actually are thinking about for, for those sites of residual disease, you know, really um, taking data, looking at, uh, this is really just lung cancer in general, not, not necessarily specific to ALK, but uh, really trying to use radiation as this consolidation therapy. So you treat to, you see maximum shrinkage and then follow that up with, with radiation. And that's something that we actually have an ongoing clinical trial trying to do that in a robust way where we're, we're studying it and, and looking at outcomes. And I think in parallel to the basic science work that Dr. Iafredi mentioned, all the combination work, I think this is actually where, um, you know, improving tools as well, like technologies, like as we get better and better at circulating tumor DNA, being able to gauge uh, minimal residual disease, I think those are also um, will help in that effort. And, and the immune system too, right? Like getting the immune system to join, join in the battle, uh, maybe a way to, to get at those, those cells that are quiescent or resistant. I, you know, I think you heard a lot about that today, but that's probably one of the most exciting parts about having TKIs and, and anti-immune uh, therapies together. Thank you. So uh, a little more on the immune system. We've had a few interesting questions from um, the audience about the natural immune response that a couple of you have seen in either your outpatients or even um, patients without, or people without cancer. Um, what proportion of outpatients do you think have this natural immune response? And could that have anything to do with how long patients are successful on say a TKI treatment? Yeah, Abile, I can, I can try to reply. This question is not easy, uh, it's a complicated matter. Um, uh, and I think we have more data, uh, not in the uh, all positive lung cancer space, but in the all positive lymphoma uh, uh, space. Uh, the reason being that uh, our community has been studied for much longer in patient with ALK lymphoma than ALK lung cancer, where it's relatively uh, a, a new uh, interest. Uh, so we know for sure that uh, in ALK positive lymphoma patient, uh, if you measure the spontaneous immune responses, and these are higher, so patients that have spontaneous higher immune responses, uh, these patients tend to have a much longer survival. Uh, of course, ALK lymphoma is still an ALK driven tumor, but is a, is a completely different disease, is a, is a disease of lymphocytes compared to epithelial cells, that is lung cancer. Uh, so it's still unclear whether this similar um, situation will apply also to all positive lung cancer patients. 
uh, the, the series that uh, Dr. Awad and, and myself analyzed uh, was relatively big, however, coming from a very heterogeneous cohort. So we saw a trend for a longer survival in patients that spontaneously had these alt specific immune responses. Uh, however, it needs to, to be further tested in much larger, larger and, uh, and better characterized studies. So we, we are trying to, to do that. Uh, but the key point is that we think that uh, these immune responses, they might happen to low levels in most patients. And, uh, and that's why basically they are not effective or, or they don't produce a strong enough immune response and you need something, something stronger to boost them. And that's where the vaccine has a role because we think that the vaccine is what brings a spontaneous immune response to a low level, to a strong level. And at that point, the immune system will start to target the tumor cells, whether they will be active tumor growing or there will be the residual tumor cells that we were talking uh, before. So that's how we see the, 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 the issue so far. And just, just to follow up a, a bit on what Dr. Caroli was saying, um, you know, we've also observed in our preliminary studies, you know, uh, Dr. Caroli, Dr. Wad, you know, they've looked a lot at antibody responses. We've also been looking at some T cell responses as well. And we're, we're even finding T cell responses in a subset of quote, healthy donors. Um, and, and you can think about that a number of ways, but, but, you know, those patients may have immunity that's actually then present, prevented them from developing an L positive lung cancer. Um, and so for, for us, you know, th those are still like really important uh, T cells to study because, you know, we, we can then sequence their TCRs and, and, and then actually then apply that to our positive lung cancer. So um, I think this, we're starting to scratch the surface of this, but still very much uh, a lot more uh, biology to study there. All right. Thank you. Unfortunately, we've only got about uh, seven or eight minutes left. Uh, I'll see if Amanda can uh, extend our session by about five hours. That'd be terrific. <laughs> um, there is a question here that uh, was asking Dr. Gaynor, but I think we could also ask Dr. Kiali this as well. Uh, HLA types and variant types, how important is that to your research and uh, what can be done in the future? Do you think HLA testing will become commonplace for all outpatients? Um, I'll start and, and then I would welcome Dr. Kiarly's thoughts as well. Um, in terms of variants, so just to uh, remind people, variants are the, the um, in those rearrangements, uh, the, the, the ALK portion is the same, it's just varying lengths of the fusion partner. So for vaccines or targeted therapies, um, you know, I think the variants will matter less, and, you know, because most of the responses that we're seeing is in that preserved kinase domain. Um, uh, we can think about, you know, with the fusions right around that junction, you know, it, it, can you, it, is that something that the immune system is reacting to? We haven't seen as much of that. Um, in terms of HLA types, um, I think that's going to play a larger role when we start thinking about both vaccines and specifically cellular therapies. Uh, cellular therapies are, we anticipate, are going to be um, contingent on particular HLA types, at least at the start. Um, but I, I know that Dr. Kiarly and others, you know, we're working on first establishing the proof of principle that these strategies work. Uh, and in parallel, uh, looking at how we can expand them to larger and larger groups of HLA types. Yeah, I can just comment on, I think that Dr. Gaynor made the point very clearly, um, uh, very likely HLA will be relevant and is a possibility that in the future testing for HLA will be a requirement, especially if there is some vaccination or clinical trial or even a vaccine approved for that, that will become mandatory. Uh, in our case, we clearly see uh, different ways how the ALK protein generates small fragments that are called peptides. And these peptides, they go on the surface of tumor cells. Uh, 
uh, in a different way dependent on the specific HLA. So some HLA can, can present multiple alpha peptides and some other HLA unfortunately cannot. So it's, it's a big difference. So HLA typing is really a key point. Before we wrap up, I, I would like the panelists who spoke about trials, so Dr. Dagogo Jack and then um, Dr. Gaynor, particularly with the Enigma trial, can you quickly go through how patients who are interested can find out more about your trial? So um, how about Dr. Dagogo Jack first, please? Perfect. So our trial is listed on clinicaltrials.gov, but you can always reach out to me, Dr. Gaynor, Dr. Jessica Lynn here, any of us, and we're happy to uh, set you up with a consult to discuss whether or not you may be eligible for the trial and also happy to see you. Currently, I know one question that often comes up is where is this trial open? So it's currently only open in Boston, unfortunately, but it will, it will be here and at Beth Israel. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. And then we had some questions about Enigma and uh, who can participate and how? I know it's not quite ready for prime time yet, but. Yeah, so um, this is actually a, a new kind of paradigm for trials um, in the sense that this is, you know, uh, uh, you don't need to travel. It, it's a web-based platform. Uh, I'll actually put the email address in the, or the, the website address in the chat. Um, essentially what happens is uh, you can go onto that website um, the website's active, but the consenting process uh, isn't yet. But uh, essentially, when one puts, you know, can can say, "Hey, I'm interested in this," then uh, a nurse will contact um, the patient by phone and actually do the informed consent entirely remotely. Um, one of the reasons why it oh, perfect, thank you. Um, one of the reasons why it's taken a bit longer is because it's entirely remote, uh, dealing with all of the legal requirements of actually uh, getting all of the data use agreement, et cetera. Um, but, but it's an entirely remote study. Uh, it's, it's more of an observational study in contrast to Dr. Dogogo Jack though. Hers is a, a treatment study. This is an observational study where we're trying to pool information. I will say uh, in the spirit of, of you know, transparency, we're trying to make all of that data de-identified, but publicly available, basically where the whole alpha positive community, as well as researchers around the world, will be able to access that because we all do better when we combine efforts. Thank you. And then Dr. Kiarle, do you have a, a, an idea about when the vaccine trial may be opening? Yeah, so that's, we are trying to, of course, to to work very actively to, to uh, open it as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, however, there are steps that we need to accomplish through the FDA approval steps and, and finalize the vaccine formulation with the company is a little bit complex step that require a lot of, uh, of biochemical step, validation, stability, uh, all technical details that the FDAs want to see before giving approval. Mm -hmm. uh, so probably it will take one year more, unfortunately, but we are trying to, to speed up as, as fast as we can. Okay. Terrific. So unfortunately, we do have to wrap up at this time. Uh, there's lots and lots and lots more questions that have been asked in the chat. Uh, we'll try to forward those questions to the doctors and maybe we can get answers to share with the group sometime in the next few weeks. Um, we're going to be taking a break for lunch at this stage and uh, Please tune in after lunch. There'll be a great interview uh, between uh, Kirk Smith and our survivor, Jamie Gibbard. Uh, meanwhile, enjoy lunch. And once again, uh, please su keep supporting uh, more research. Uh, you've seen just a little sample of what our research is achieving. And it's really making uh, strides and advances in improving our treatments, both in the near term and even more importantly for the long term. And I wish everyone a good lunch and we'll see you after the break. Thank you very much, everyone.